start recording the computer, the tight shot, overhead, close up, and the shoulder shot. Let's fire up the Roadcaster. It does look kind of cool starting up. Yesterday, I dropped a brand new video on the new Roadcaster video, this device right here. You guys seem to love this thing, which I completely understand, and there were a whole bunch of questions. So this is a video to try and answer some of those questions. I've got some of this sort of pre-planned in my head, but a lot of this we're gonna make up as we go. So let's just see if I can get through these questions and answer the ones you wanna know about. First big question, if you yank the SSD drive while recording, will the files close? This is one of the really cool things about the ATEM, where if you are recording and you yank out the SSD, the way that it writes its files, they're always closed, I guess, frame by frame, so you don't lose anything. So we're gonna test that out. The drive's already connected, everything's already running through. Just gonna hit the record button there. and yank the drive. So we'll plug this into the computer. There's a folder. The videos do not look closed, so these are corrupted. Okay, the answer to question one, no, if you yank the SSD drive, the files will not be closed, you will lose the files. Question two. How long can the road last on battery? This obviously is going to depend on the battery that you plugged in. In my original video, I had plugged in this big small rig VB212, that's 212 watt hours of power, and it reported a, very conveniently, 12 hour runtime. That may not be scientific, I haven't actually run it through the 12 hours, but this 212 reported 12 hours, so you can do the math and extrapolate from there. Can it route a phone call through Bluetooth? Now this is kind of interesting because the device can make a Bluetooth connection and it can connect to your phone, can you route a phone call through it? So the only way to find this out is to test it. Let's do it. I do have a Bluetooth spot, so let's go ahead and turn that on. And in my phone, I'll go to the settings, Bluetooth. There's the Roadcaster video. All right, so we know the Bluetooth settings are set to go out the Roadcaster video. So now to find out if we can route a call. So I'm gonna call my buddy, Chris. Hello, do you hear me this time? <laughs> Excellent, it works, okay. All right, well, that works. That is extremely cool. Someone was asking about the RTMP streaming settings. I know I didn't really explore that last time, so let's just have a look in there. There's not a whole lot that you can control, but here's what you've got. If you go into the streaming profiles, the way that you create a profile is just click add profile, there's your new one, give it a name, and then enter the server and the stream key. So that's the URL and the stream key that you get from YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, wherever you're streaming to. So this means you can stream it to anywhere that will take an RTMP stream. As far as the control over the quality, you don't have much. Under stream settings, you have the options to go from low, medium, or high. And the actual bit rates are not exposed in there. I'm sure you could test them and start running them to various networks and they would report to some degree what you're getting, but that information is not disclosed in here. There's no customization of it. That's basically it. What if any latency is being added by the Roadcaster video itself? So we all know that when you run an HDMI camera into a recorder or switcher or whatever, there is some degree of latency. Some cameras have lower latency than others, but there is pretty much always some. How do we measure that? Well, I, I thought up a kind of a cool, clever way. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to enable the timecode preview on my cameras. I'm running everything through timecode here. So we're gonna see the timecode coming out of the top-down camera. We're going to then plug that output into a recorder, look at the inherent latency, meaning what we normally have from the camera to the output, and then we're gonna route the same signal through the Roadcaster video and check it again. So to do this, I've got my trusty old Atomos Shogun with timecode going into it. We're gonna take a look at the settings for the overhead camera, and I'm going to enable on the info display over SDI. These are the BGH1 cameras that I'm able to control through software if you aren't familiar with those. I'll link to that video as well. It's an older video, but the BGH1s are still so cool. All right, now I need to take the 
top-down camera that was routed into here, which is green cable here on input two. And I'm gonna plug this into the Shogun. And we can see on here the time code coming out of the camera and the actual time code that the Shogun's getting from the Type 1 generator. So what I'll do is take a picture of this screen and let's take a look at the difference in those time codes. Time code from the camera is 03 and 14 frames, and the time code from the device is 03 and 19 frames. So that's 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Five frame delay from the camera to its own output. Now we're gonna route the same signal through the road. The camera's back into the road. Let's take the output. We're gonna plug that into HDMI B. So we get the program out. And there we go. So now we're looking at the same thing. Camera now passing through the roadcaster into the Shogun. Well, let's measure it again. 1509 to 15, 16 or 17. Let's call it 17. So that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Eight frames. That's only a three frame difference. I did remember that number right. Cool. Not too bad. Next. Test how the auto switching handles silence and people talking over each other. Now, this isn't something that I can just test here on my own. I do plan to do a full video on that capability, the auto switching, because it is just so incredibly cool. I really want to put it through the paces, not something I can do by myself. So that one will have to come another day, but make sure you're subscribed so you see when that video comes out. Since the audio delay is on the master signal, you see in here, if we go to the audio mixer, there is a delay that is programmed into the master. This is not a per input delay. The question was what then happens to the videos that are playing internally, are those also getting delayed or what's happening there? Aaron Parecki in his video has apparently explored this more deeply. The short answer is that the video playback is not going to be delayed while the inputs are. However, it seemed like there might be some differences between how the wireless is handled using the Wireless Pro and other microphone sources. So I'll link to his video down below. Make sure you watch that when you're done watching this one. Can the device get power over PoE or PoE plus or PoE plus plus? I very, very seriously doubt it. I think that if it could, they would have told us this, but there's only one way to really find out and that's to test it. So let's get rid of all this and let's see if I have a long enough ethernet cable to run from the rack. I knew it was a good idea when I measured all of my cables and labeled them. So this one's 15 meters, 11 meters to the back of the room. This should definitely work. This is now plugged into a PoE Plus switch, so let's power it off safely. Remove the power, remove the existing network, and plug in a PoE cable. Moment of truth. No. I really would not have expected that. I think they would have told us that if that worked. A viewer was concerned about the power being over USB-C and that it was not a locking cable. The ATEMs have a nice little locking cable. This USB-C cable could be unplugged quite easily. Turns out there actually is a little lock for this. I saw it in one of the marketing photos that Rode had sent. There it is. You can see the little lock on there that would plug in right there. And I don't have one of those. Unless there's one in the box and I missed it. There's something in here. These are just the caps for the antenna. They did include their own USB cable, which I'm not using. I'll have to ask them about that. That seems like something that they would have included. It's obviously just a tiny little piece of plastic, but. Someone was asking if the audio does come over the HDMI. Now, I, I did show this in the first video, but maybe I went by it too quickly. So we're gonna assume that, not that they didn't watch the whole video. The way the audio comes over HDMI is in the audio settings. You click on the plus and you can add audio from whichever HDMI input you want. So let's see, HDMI 2 is my top down camera. There you can see the audio coming through from that camera. So there is audio over HDMI, you just have to enable it. Another viewer asked if it was 8-bit or 10-bit recording on the input. And I said, well, I'm sure it's 8-bit, it's just H.264. And they said, well, the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO does 10-bit recording. And I thought, really? That seems interesting. I don't think I know that. So I figured we should test it. We're gonna compare. 
we're going to compare the recording of the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO and the Rodecaster video. Let me go get it. Just a little size difference comparison for you, in case you were curious. First, I will record with the Rodecaster. So let's plug the drive back in, hit record, and I'll just switch to a couple of different inputs in there. Good enough. Now let's fire up the ATEM, put it on the network, give it some power, and I'll steal a couple of inputs from the road and plug in my OWC drive. Everything appears to be ready to go. Let's hit record and we're good to go. That's all we need now to check these out. I'm going to import these into Resolve because I can see the bit depth in Resolve, which I don't think I can see in QuickTime Player. There's the files. I'm going to grab an ISO file from the ATEM and an ISO file from the Rode. All right, let's take a look at the differences. We can see that one camera, which is the Rode, is an H.264 main L4.2, and it is an 8-bit bit depth as expected. The ATEM, on the other hand, is H.264 main L4.1, and it is also 8-bit bit depth. So the viewer who reported that there was 10-bit bit depth, it doesn't seem to be the case. Now, if you're seeing otherwise, I would certainly love to know where. So if you're watching this, do comment below. Let me know where you thought that 10-bit came in. But this hardware is completely up to date. I did verify that, and we're getting 8-bit. An observation that you can connect a Rodecaster Pro 2 via USB if you want physical faders, physical sliders to adjust your audio levels. So instead of using the built-in audio capabilities via the XLR and controlling it in software, you can take a whole separate audio interface from Rode, plug that in over USB-C, and get all your audio through that. That's pretty cool. And I guess that's it. So hopefully that answered some of the most pressing questions. I'm sure there will be more to come. Go ahead and drop them below on this video or in the original one. Maybe I'll do another one of these later, but I certainly am going to be doing a lot more videos about this Rodecaster video because it is kind of cool. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the video. You know the routine. I'll see you guys in the next video.